Okay, and we're live on the Niche Agent. So today we've got a great guest for you. It's Pat Hyben. So Pat, you're from Keller Williams in Maryland. T take a quick second and tell us a bit about yourself and why you're here. Well, Brian, thanks for having me. First of all, this is exciting. I have um, been in the real estate game for 27 years, uh, and uh, I probably successfully tackled, you know, between five and ten niches, uh, many of which I didn't stick with, uh, some that I did or, or, or currently. I am, I still am, I still feel the pulse every day of the real estate game, but I have sold my real estate team to a longtime partner who runs it. He calls me for advice and we talk about advice and he's tackling certain niches now, but, um, um, but it's been fun, and uh, I've I've done a lot, and I've done a lot of different things, and I had a lot of fun, and uh, I'm excited to be here to talk about it. Awesome. Well, for you, um, one of the big things you're working on right now is you have a, a podcast where you interview agents as well. So can you just kind of briefly touch about that and talk about what you do with that? Yeah, sure, Ryan. I mean, it's called Pat Hyben Interviews Real Estate Rockstars. And um, it's it's a little clumsy of a name, but I wanted to get across exactly what it was. I wanted to be able to use my name because I had some name recognition from a book that I read that a book my book that I wrote that has done really well. We've sold about thirty thousand copies now, um, and um, called Six Steps to Seven Figures. So this podcast was kind of a tie in to Six Steps to Seven Figures, which was a which was kind of a story of my life in real estate. And um, and then we I wanted to dig in and find out about everyone else's life in real estate. So I had a good friend and a mentor, Howard Britton, who had done this for years and, and had actually sold CDs of agent interviews for a couple of decades. And he passed away. And a few years after that, I, you know, started talking with some of our cohorts who knew Howard well, and I thought, you know what, I should just pick up where he left off. Of course, the industry had changed drastically since then, and you really couldn't sell CDs uh, because everything became free on iTunes, and podcasts became free. So I just created the podcast, and three days a week we have a different interview from a different agent around the world. We've had them um, from Scotland and Australia and New Zealand and South Africa and uh, a lot in Canada and um, and all over the U.S. and we we really have a diverse crowd and uh, interesting uh, advice from everybody and uh, it's been a really fun thing to do and it's a really uh, it's an additional way for me to give back. Yeah, it's it's why I'm doing this podcast as well. It's really fun. It's a great way to connect with people. It also helps you up your game and just stay on top of things because when you're hearing from some of the greatest agents out there, it just helps you internalize it and helps you see the business as a whole and not just your own your own path. Absolutely. There's a great quote I love from James Allen who wrote As a Man Thinketh, and he says, uh, you cannot dream within and stand still without. And I think what's happened to me is uh, after, you know, several months of interviewing people and finding out what, you know, finding out they're making money and finding out that they're doing things with ease and and that sort of thing, I've picked up the phone and called Mike Sloan, my partner, and been like, Mike, we should be doing this. Or, Mike, we should be doing this. Or, we got to change this. And so uh, it's definitely been helping our real estate business as well, and so it's um, it's been a neat neat process to go through. So, for the listeners that uh, may not know who you are, can you talk about about your your past business and, and the level you got? Because you're not just a small fish. You you've done a lot of business and you've been around long enough to to have a good name out there. So, can you talk about about your numbers and what you've accomplished? Yeah, sure. So, I started out full time, fresh out of college, um, and. Um, that this is really the only profession, so to speak, that I've had, and I um, been at uh, several different companies. You know, I've I've 
sold as many houses as uh, I think my best year was 507 homes in a year. Um, that was $207 million in volume. Wow. Um, and $5.2 million in gross commission income. And, um, you know, we had a lot of fun uh, back then. We were doing a ton of business. Um, then, of course, the, the market crashed. And, of course, it took me, you know, I spent, you know, 15 years or so or more, 17 years or so, before we started really, really building that that team that did that sort of volume. And uh, those were all years I spent in the ditches, you know. Um, and then uh, when the market crashed, I kind of um, took my chips off the table, so to speak. And um, I went to my partner, Mike Sloan, and asked him if he wanted to take over the business. This is at the same time where I finished writing my book, and I was asked to go on a 53-city, seven-month uh, book tour. In order for anybody to do that, they need somebody handling all of their crap at home. So Mike took over, and um, he took over the business, and he ran it. And so when I came back from book tour, it, you know, it was pretty much running by itself, and I thought to myself, hey, you know, I want to go, um, I'm going to take a month off, and then I'm going to get into the game of uh, helping other agents and selling products and developing more products uh, that I can parlay off of the success of this book. And um, so I took about a month off, and then I spent about a month studying um, different programs of where people were teaching how to monetize real estate or uh, inspirational advice, let's say. And, um, you know, I put it all down. I said, you know, that's hard work. I don't really want to do that. <laughs> uh, luckily for me, I had made uh, a, a good amount of money selling houses, and I saved a lot of that commission. And so I said, you know, I'm just not going to do anything for a while. And, and what happened was that once I opened the door up to other possibilities, I began to uh, be offered opportunities to get involved in small private companies, um, to buy into apartment buildings, um, buy other single family homes and rent them out. And, and, and all kinds of things have come to me. And some of which also is the podcast, which has come to me. So, um, so that's what I've been doing. But at the same time, I do hold an office, physical office location, which happens to be, where my real estate team resides, so I'm able to, to, you know, pat everybody on the back and touch everybody, you know, once or twice a week because I come in here to, to work for the podcast or for some investments that I have or what have you, and um, I'm just kind of uh, watching things and checking boxes and counting, counting my numbers and, and uh, looking at opportunities at this point. Awesome. So I want to go deeper then with your actual real estate business itself and how you got to to doing those kind of numbers. Obviously, this is the the we all the niche agent in Canada, or the niche agent in the states. For you, what were some of those niches niches that you focused on that really helped you get there? Well, um, you know, the first niche we probably got into were neighborhood niches where we just became the neighborhood expert, and you know, um, I've always be believed that you should build. Uh, from a success up, not from the ground up. Meaning if you've sold one house in a neighborhood, it's going to be so much easier for you to get a listing in that neighborhood, a second listing, than it is to go into a neighborhood where you've never sold anything. Does that make sense? Because yeah, you, you're instantly the neighborhood expert. Yeah. Right or wrong, yeah. you know, the house probably sold because of MLS and because you priced it right, but it doesn't matter. Uh, as far as the people that live there are concerned, uh, you're a neighborhood expert, you know, and, yeah. and 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 you have such a higher value than the agent who's never sold anything in there. So you build on that success, and we've done that with several neighborhoods where we just, you know, would sell one house, and then we'd send a just listed card, and then a just sold card, and then um, put up a giant sold sign, and and over time they would they would get hit several times by our stuff. 
and we'd list another house and another house and another house, and we'd just hyper-focus on that neighborhood. And we we had neighborhoods where, you know, I've had, I have neighborhoods that sold over 200 houses just in this small subdivision over the years. Yeah. Um, and that's, quite frankly, now looking back, you know, what happened was in 2007, 2008, when things started crashing, as a cost-cutting measure, we pulled back on all of our mailings and all of our focus on some of these niche neighborhoods and and now that the market's hot again I, uh, that, that's definitely a regret that I have uh, I, if I could go back and change it I would have encouraged Mike Sloan to keep up that that marketing keep up that stranglehold on that neighborhood because other agents have now gotten in and taken over where we left off several years ago. And it would be very difficult to get back in now. Yeah, yeah you're fighting against them, and it's going to cost you even that much more to, to break back into exactly, it. Exactly, exactly. So for you then, what type of numbers were you getting for dollars spent? Like, did you, did you track that kind of information? Because I know a lot of people get stuck up on they don't want to spend X amount of dollars because they don't know how much they're going to make out of it. But did you kind of know if you spend this much or spend this much time, you were going to get these kind of results? Yes, that's a great question. I mean, uh, you know, we go for anything above one for two, but the, the, you know, some of our brilliant campaigns, we've gotten one for four, one for five, which means spend one dollar, get four. Um, one of the things I write about in my book um, is in a television niche that we got into where uh, we picked a specific county with specific uh, re- uh, television stations that just focused on one specific area, and you can do that nowadays with cable. It doesn't have to be so broad. Mm-hmm. You know, with cable you can divide it up into geographic areas that you decide to advertise to, and so we were able to do that. And we um, uh, copied another agent's television commercial out of out of Arizona and and brought it to Maryland. And we were getting four to one, which means we would spend one dollar and we would get four dollars. And I actually outlined the exact numbers, but you know, several million dollars we made um, from spending, you know, several hundred thousand over, you know, over time. And uh, it was an incredible return on investment. Um, that that was great. And 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 you know, there's certainly hopes that you could do that again. Um, I think the best returns are probably things like that, like television, radio, or, or cold calling, you mm-hmm. know, telemarketing, hiring telemarket, hiring virtual assistants, telemarketing, things like that. I think the aggressive things like that are probably where you're going to get your best return over time. Yeah. And I find a lot of agents are afraid to spend the money up front because they're not getting the results right away. But there are proven methods to get business and there's proven returns on investments where you, you people know when I spend this much money I'm going to get this much back and I find a lot of agents back off or they get afraid of it or they or they just start spending enough money and then they don't see the results results right away and they pull out and then they just waste even more money right so for you I know yeah. one of the big things you did like you said you were doing commercials on TV what um how long did it take to kind of get the results that you were looking for in that because some people have tried commercials or they try one but then they pull up. So what was what was that path like? <laughs> well, it's funny because, you know, as always, and as anything, results may vary, but I'll never forget the day. is one of the highlights of my life. We, we, we spent a lot of time um, making this commercial. I'm not an actor, but I wanted it to be me, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and it took actually two days in the, in the humid heat and the sun outside of a house um, in, a, in a suit um, to make the commercial and get it right, uh, there, you know, back then we didn't have the, as great technology as they have now, and we wanted to do it all without, you know, editing it here and there. And um, so we got it done, and we spent a lot of time and effort in it, and we put it out there, and the first day that it was on TV, uh, somebody called on it. Hmm. And it was so funny. It was like, I can't explain it other than funny, because... It was like, today's the day that our commercial's out there. I wonder, you know, how it's going to do. And all of a sudden, the phone rang, and the guy said, hey, I saw you on TV. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> um, and uh, and then we just grew from there. You know, we started out spending a couple thousand a month, 2,000 actually a month, and 
at its peak, we were spending uh, twenty five thousand dollars a month um, on on television, and we were getting over an appointment a day, a listing of we, you know, several months we had an appointment a day from from a listing appointment a day, all listings, yeah. you know, no really very few buyers, all listings, which was great, which was our goal. It's funny because you mentioned the twenty five thousand a month. Some agents would hear that and cringe and almost get sick of stomach thinking about spending that, but the returns you get on that is is far outweighs the cost to do it. Right, right. And and I don't know if it worked now or not. I mean, we tried it. My partner Mike wanted to try it again last year, and he said we should make a new commercial. And and we actually made a commercial. It's all all the commercials, by the way, are on YouTube. If you just go to YouTube uh, backslash Pat Hyde and just type my name in the YouTube. But um, the um, you know, we did this commercial called It's Been 10 Years. So, um, it's, you know, it's 2014. I think, you know, um, we probably did them up to 2006, 2007, mm-hmm. I think. But anyways, we we just did one called It's Been 10 Years. And it's, it said it's been, t- it's been over 10 years or something like that. And um, blah, blah, blah. And we, we put it out there for 90 days and it, and it failed. Um and it was expensive. We were, we were probably, you know, you know, our perception of expense is a little different now that, that the market has changed. But uh, it was probably five or six grand a month. And I said, "Do you still want to do it?" And our tolerance is a lot low now, a lot less now than it once was. And uh, and I got somebody else that that I got to cater to. He pretty much runs the show, so mm-hmm. he decided to pull it off, it, figuring it didn't work. But um, so everything works you know, in a, in the right market. And that's the thing with niches is you got to follow your market. One of the, one of the biggest niches that I made money off of was in the downturn when, when the crap hit the fan, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine and he said, you want to go where the money is flowing. And I thought to myself, where is the money flowing? And at the time, it was 2009, maybe, and um, 2008, and the money's flowing in the foreclosures and short sales. This is this was a year earlier. No one had even heard. No, no one even understood what a short sale was. Mm-hmm. Um, now it's a household name, you know, and so the money was flowing there. So we then began to prospect uh, banks for foreclosures, and I, you know, I had zero. And at our peak, we built it up to 301. At one point, we had 325 listings, uh, you know, from 47 banks, I think it was, um, 47 banks and asset management companies. And, and, and we really jumped into that niche and just beat the crap out of it, you know, just really niche down on that and, and did extremely well with that as well. And now we still have the big players. What's happened in that niche is that um, all the asset management companies have gone out of business and, and all the small banks have just, um, you know, outsourced their stuff but um, or gotten rid of it all. Yeah. Um, and all that's left is Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and HUD for the most part. So... You know, and we still have those, and we still do a ton of a ton of those, but no, no certainly nowhere near uh, at, at its peak. You know, we we hit that at a really good time, and uh, again, a really fun time. And uh, so, I would say there's probably three stages of my 27 years where we really four stages delved into a niche and and uh, built it up. First was uh, the neighborhood niche that I talked about with postcards and sold signs. The second was the um, television market, the third was the REO, and then there was a time, too, when we did the luxury market. I I had realized at one point that I, you know, had never sold a, uh, a home. I'd only sold one home in 15 years over a million bucks, and so I made a conscious decision that we were going to become luxury home experts, and I set out a goal of, you know, selling 10 houses the next year over a million dollars, settling 10 houses, and we put a step-by-step plan into place, and we actually settled exactly 10 houses over a million dollars, wow. and that was a 
another hyper focus uh, that we did on a niche. So we've done several. Good. And I find like you mentioned it actually when you were talking is being the first to market sometimes is better than even just being the best. So you said you'd got in with the, the short sales and REOs. You were there before most people were there and you got a lot of business. And what I find is a lot of agents come in as the wave is riding and they try to get in on things and they've kind of missed the boat. So being that first to market, doing the, the TV ads, was obviously you were the first probably one in your area really focusing and doing that. And sometimes just being that first person is all you need. Do you, did you find like there was much competition or that you kind of owned it and then people started jumping on? Or Well, yeah, you know, I think it's a fallacy to say first to market. I, I, I would say um, at the time in my head with what we had known, I was last. To, I was thinking I was last to market, but I could still get in. Okay. Like yeah. with REOs, there was a couple of agents doing them, and I thought, "Man, I, I'm like the new guy. Mm-hmm. How am I going to get in on this?" And and now that I look back on it, after I got in, tons of people got in. Mm-hmm. So I was kind of first to market. Same thing with the, um, you know, same thing with the other the television. There was a there was a guy in Arizona doing them. And uh, some other areas, but uh, I guess I was pretty much first to market in my area. Or I think people actually, there was a guy that was doing them here, but they weren't good. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. And they weren't, they weren't, they weren't like um, so massively repetitive. And so what I went in is I did it better with a better message, yeah. and I thought I was a better actor, and I, I. Did, did 10 times as many as he did and then you know eight months later he wasn't he stopped doing them because we were pummeling him yeah and that's it's the consistency is is also the key too like i I know we had i just had chris suarez on um so he does open houses and he was doing them seven days a week and it was again it was outside of the box other agents were thinking saturday sundays two to four that's when they're gonna do their open houses and he took a different spin on it and just went hard with it went deep went and, and focused on that and just came up with a better strategy and a better system than other agents and he cleaned up from doing that absolutely yeah so, yep yeah it's 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 choosing the right market is important timing is important too uh one of the guests i had barry lebo on um he was one of my first guests he's been in the business for 37 years and he said it's it's you you run with it until it until that well dries up and then you move on and, and take over another one and it i guess it also depends on what niche you have because some are lifelong ones. Some are, like you said, the short sales were for that period of time. You kind of rode that wave and, and you cleaned up from it, but then you got to always be watching for what's next and what's coming around the corner. Mm-hmm. So for you, can I want to talk about the, that book then. What, what was that process like from taking it from your real estate business and what transitioned you into writing that book and why and, and what was that process like for you? You know, um, First of all, they say you never really write a book, you just rewrite a book. (laughs) And I think there's a lot of truth to that. So what happened with me was, so I got in a situation, a a personal situation, I guess, you know, there there was a time in this, um, in our market, like, you know, from 2001 to probably 2006, you know, no matter what you touched, it turned to gold. You know, everybody was a golden child. And, um, you know, I had a title company, I had a mortgage company, I had a 50-some person real estate team, every different, you know, we tried postcards, we tried television, radio, whatever we did, it worked. And um, it was like, you couldn't go wrong. And so, um, you know, I was offered a job, um, you know, doing something um, to make, uh, at the time, it seemed like significantly more money, and uh, I said, "Sure, I got all these other things going. Let me juggle another ball too." And so, what happened was, uh, for, for one of the first times in my life since I was probably fifteen or sixteen and kind of a rebellious teenager, I got in with a um, a boss that I didn't like, a person that a partner that I didn't like, and uh, we got into fights, or just arguments, and. It just ended bad. It didn't last but six months, but it ended bad. And so as a therapy, I actually started writing a book about how to be a good boss versus how to be a bad boss. And I wrote this book. And so I took it to Jay Papazon, who's a best-selling author with Gary Keller, and 
I gave it to him, and he looked at it, and he said, Pat, you know, this book sucks. <laughs> He's like, it's terrible. Yeah. He's like, um, you know, it's a bunch of ADD journal entries, basically, which it was. Yeah. And um, he said, you don't, you don't have the credibility. He said, what people really want is they want to hear from you. They want to hear how you went from 10 sales a year your first year to 507 sales and what process you took to get there. And and so I went back to the drawing board, and and now I'm in the mode of writing. Now I'm a quote-unquote writer after this terrible book that I wrote. And so I wrote another book, and we called it The Pat Hyben Way. Mm-hmm. And um, so it was 400 pages. And uh, he Jay told me, he said, you got to put everything you have into it. And it's funny because I heard a podcast actually recently from a guy that works for a book publisher, and he says that's actually what they tell all their authors as part of the game, and then they tell them to pull it back after they put their all into it. So I put my all into it, 400 some pages, and then Jay gave me the same advice that this guy on the podcast said he gives everybody kind of like a trick that they play yeah. on all authors, and he said you need to cut it in half. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, you got to be kidding me. I, you know, I can't cut this big thing in half. I, you told me to put everything in here. It took me two years to put everything in here. So then I went back to the drawing board. I went back. I actually went to a, uh, the public library and sat in a like a closed room. And I spread out all these boxes. I brought a box full of papers and spread it out. And did it. And and so I had like it was chron- it was a chronological history of my of my life. Let's just say mm-hmm. in. So I said, well, let's just break it down into what is mo- what are the what are the most important points. And um, so I had it broken down into like ten points, and then and and I still didn't have a name. And I think sometimes that is, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. For me, it was a good thing because I didn't have a name. I didn't know what I want to call. It. I I was really feeling like the Pat Hyben way was like this way too egotistical. <laughs> I didn't I didn't I didn't like that. You yeah. know what I mean? I didn't want to be that guy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I didn't want my face on the cover of a book, and 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 so, um, so anyway, to make a long story short, I was talking with Michael Mayer, the, who who wrote a book called Seven L. We Seven just had him on the show, so yeah, he was on two All episodes right, ago. So yeah. All right, awesome. And, um, you know, he's real creative, and um, he's like, first of all, you got to say something about million people like million, and. Um, they they love millions. So I came up with seven figures because there was all this other million stuff out there, you know. Everybody's there's several real estate books as you know, mm-hmm. you know, millionaire, real estate agent, blah blah blah. Yeah. So, um and then I was talking to another guy named Bob Kalinsky over dinner one night and he was like, Well really what your book needs to be is if you do this, you'll get that. Mm-hmm. And I said, Well, I know that you know, seven figures or a million, if you do this you'll get a million and so, and sitting in the library, I, I bo- it boiled down, and it just so happened that there were six, uh, six piles of advice that I boiled it down. I said, "Oh, here it is: six steps to seven figures," and it just flowed, mm-hmm. you know. And it, it just the universe came together, it just worked, you know. And I was like, "Oh, six steps to seven figures." And so, the the book outlines the exact six, the, the most important of all steps that a real estate agent can take to be successful, it, it, it fell in the six different piles, and um, and that's that's the answer to your question. Awesome. So for you then, how has that changed yourself, and how has that changed your business after writing that book? Well, it certainly changed the way I, I advise people. You know, I mean, immediately when people ask me advice, are you doing this, are you doing that, you know, I can, I can r- rattle them off. Um, and, um, it, how has it changed my business? Uh, you know, I mean, I think business, the business is just going to change no matter what. Uh, I, I've, my life has changed drastically in what happened was personally for me, once I was cut off of, um, the real estate game, right? Mm-hmm. The rat race, so to speak. Um, I opened myself up to many new things. And so what happened was I had two 
I have or had two uh, daughters in high school, and I said, you know what, let me just chill out and let them finish high school and spend time with the family and see what happens. And then I ended up volunteering for a charity uh, that mentors kids, and I took on two uh, boys that uh, whose mother's in jail and, and father is in jail. And, um, and I... Uh, like I said before, now I have 14 companies and I have um, about 30 other uh, rental properties and, and apartment buildings. And um, I don't think any of that would have happened if I hadn't stopped and, uh, you know, cut everything off because I had this book tour to go to. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It's like I came back. And, and, and it just allowed that. I was a good friend of mine, David Osborne, and I were having a talk the other day. And, they, and he was saying, I don't understand how you get offered all these deals. You know, like I, I got I got in, in a, a, a gene company, I'm dealing with something with a jeans company uh, last week. And this and I, we just settled on a liquor store yesterday and. And I am uh, that I bought. I only own ten percent of it, but I gave him money to start it. And and I have some guys coming to me tonight, to t- believe it or not, to talk about a medical marijuana dispensary. Um, and 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 these are all randoms, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And and he says, "Well, how do you get all these random people calling you from a liquor store to to jeans?" Yeah. <laughs> this is all in the last week. Yeah. And, and I think the answer to that is, I said, well, maybe if you stopped working so hard, it would happen to you. You know, you, you, you're not going to find that enlightenment, for lack of a better way to put it, um, unless uh, you kind of open yourself up to it. And that's what happened with me. Is like I, was for, I opened myself up to it, and all of a sudden all these people started coming into my life. And the jury's not out yet, you know. Um, sometimes I interview some of these agents, and I think to myself, Damn, I, I wish I was selling still because <laughs> they're making so much profit. Yeah, you know, I mean, we're certainly not making the profit that that uh, that some of these guys are. And I know that after 27 years in the business, if I was still in the game, I would be making a a lot of a freaking profit. <laughs> um, so, but you know, it is what it is. You know, and you're enjoying what you're doing too, though, that, and that's important. And... Absolutely, my life is good. Yeah. Because I find a lot of agents have their nose to the grind, and they're making a lot of money, but they hate their life, and they're just doing it because that's what they know. And if they, like you said, you took that time, you took that break to really reflect and look at things, and it, it changed how you've seen it. Because a lot of agents have been in the business for years, and they know nothing else. And if they, if they really talk, took the time to reflect and stop and look at their business, they may, they may change things if they actually took that break. I know, and there's, there's, there's nothing more tragic than a real estate agent that, that where anybody really that spends their life hyper focused on something and making all this money and, and 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 not paying attention to life around them and their family and that sort of thing and then and then they lose it all. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then they're st- and here they are, sixty five and broke and for what? You know? Yeah. Okay. Well where where do you see the future for yourself and your future business then? That's a great question. You know, um, I, I, I certainly see more of the same. I don't see myself working um, harder by any means. Um, you know, but it's so hard to say. You know, um, it's sad because uh, sad is a bad word. Um, you know, um, so much has happened since I, I think since I uh, wrote the book, and it seems like I, you know, would s- I've set goals that um, that I've changed uh, because I didn't. You know, other things came to me. Like a year ago, I would have never been able to say, "Oh, I was going to own just a random thing, ten percent of a liquor store." I mean, I have no interest in that. But someone came to me, and the return was good, and I said, "Okay, I'll give you this money, and I'll." you know, help you open this liquor store. So it's just all, you know, I, I can't, I, I used to think, I guess, here's here's the revelation. That's a great question. Um, I used to think that was bad, I guess, that I, I would set goals and then 
and, and, and to not achieve a goal or to change a goal or erase a goal or not really know how to answer your question um, is bad. But now I see it, it's okay because, you know, certainly Bill Gates had no idea that Microsoft was going to be as big as he made it, you know, yep. as it became, or, or Steve Jobs. You know, they just wanted to make a computer. Mm-hmm. You know, they just wanted to do what they loved to do. And I think that's really what I'm doing now. Is I'm doing my podcast. I love to do it. Um, as you know, it's it's very difficult to monetize and make money from them. Um, uh, but it's sort of like Bill Gates, you know, with uh, all he wanted to do was make one computer. All we want to do is 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 do podcasts. Where it will lead us, we don't know. Yeah, exactly. Nor did he. Yeah. You know, we it feels right. And I think that I'll do the same. I'll continue to to, to invest money. Um, I'll continue to be intrigued by investing, and I'll continue to be on the pulse of the real estate world because that is my world. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as where I'll be and exactly, it, I would probably have to just say, you know, m- more of the same, but not more hard work of the same. You know, <laughs> not not more hours. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, well, we'll check in with you in a year or two and see where you're at and see how things are, are progressing then and see where you're at. Okay. That would be awesome. So what we'll do is uh, if you can just kind of share a, a golden nugget, a good piece of information that we can our listeners can take away from. So if, if they are thinking about getting started or even in some of the niches or just, just good advice that people can uh, really resonate with. Well, I think, you know, regarding the niches, um, you have to decide who you are and who you are not, you know. Um, and I think that's where people go wrong, you know. They they don't decide who they are not. Mm-hmm. Um, for instance, we started a group called GoBundance, um, which is just a bunch of uh, real estate investors who like to take hikes, for lack of a better way to go, do outdoor activities. Mm-hmm. And a couple of guys in the group, were saying, oh, we should let women in, you know? And, uh, you know, I didn't think that that was, should be the case because when you're out hiking, you're farting and you're, <laughs> you're, you're telling crude jokes. and You know what I mean? It's like a poker game yeah. or something, you know? And I was like, there's no need. Let's just decide who we are and who we are not. And I think it works because it's all men, you know? It's a men's group. Mm-hmm. There's certainly women's group. It's not sexist. There's plenty of women's groups and plenty of men's groups. That's why I have sororities and fraternities. And so I think the same thing applies with niches. You have to decide who you are and who you are not and, and, and decide, okay, I am um, this niche. Uh, I am a luxury home expert. I am a, um, you know, I talk to, I'm, I'm at a loss for the guy's name. I don't know if you interviewed him or not. He's out, he's out of Washington, D.C., and he does uh, only um, contemporary, uh, very artistic homes. No, I but I will put them on my list of people to have on the show. So I'll connect I'll, with you after. I'll have Matt. Name. I'll have Matt interview you. Uh, send him. Send you the information. Awesome. He was a great niche guy. But the, but um, um, but anyway, that's my point. Is that um, you just have to decide to do it and then hyper focus. I really I interviewed the Jills at a Miami Beach last week. And and they are they were the number one agent in the in the world uh, according to them last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, they did half a billion dollars in um, in, in in volume wow. last year, five hundred and fifty four million. Wow! And um, they decided twenty years ago to only do luxury. Mm-hmm. You know. And I really think that if, if there was a 20-year-old kid that came to me and said, Pat, you know, I can go anywhere in the world and I can do anything I want to do, uh, and I want to do real estate, and I want to do a niche, what would it be? And I, I would say, well, if, if you have no constraints, you know, go to a market like Miami or, or California, you know, Los Angeles, New York City, and, and just – Make that your niche, yeah. right? right? I mean, really, if I had to do it over again, the commissions are so huge. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? 
and the, and these people are the, the the Jills and these guys like the the million dollar listing that you see on TV. These are, these guys are no different than you or me. Yep. You know. They just focus. I mean, some of them, are, yeah, they just focus. I mean, some of them come from other countries. A lot of them. You look at the one in New York. The one guy comes from Puerto Rico, and the one guy comes from Sweden, right? Yeah. And and every every commission they make, and they've only been in, and they're all in their thirties. Every commission they make is, you know, fifty, eighty grand. And so, given the choice for some serious advice, if you're going to make a niche. Make it one where there's big commissions. Mm-hmm. You know, don't make it don't don't make it where you're making a couple hundred dollars. <laughs> that would be my advice, and I think that's very prudent business advice. That's great advice. So, for the listeners, then, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Then, uh, we'll we'll put the link to your book, and we'll put the link to your videos as well. But what other ways can people connect with you? Yeah, sure. Well, I'm on all the social media. Um, you know, I'm on Facebook. I got nine thousand friends on Facebook. It's Pat Hyven or Patrick Hyven. And I'm on Instagram, at Pat Hyben. I'm on Twitter. Um, no, Instagram is I am Pat Hyben. Twitter is at Pat Hyben. Um, I'm, you know, the book is pathyben.com. It's hybendigital.com, which is the uh, podcast. And you can certainly hear that, uh, download that on iTunes and, and Stitcher, just like yours. Uh, so, you know. It's, it, nowadays, it's almost a silly question because it's like uh, the answer is just uh, just Google me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So we'll we'll put that in the show notes so people can check it out if they want to link to that. So again, we appreciate you being on the show. It's uh, you're a fantastic guest, and it was a great insight and a lot of knowledge that you shared with us. So thank you. My pleasure. I had a lot of fun. Thanks.